and five, four, three, two, and one. And welcome everyone to this episode of the Real Leaders Podcast. All right, and welcome everyone to the Real Leaders Podcast. Uh, today we're having on James Thornton, the CEO of Klein Earth. James, thanks for being with us today. Pleasure. And before we begin, folks, just want to let you all know what you're seeing right now and how this is working. If you're watching this on LinkedIn, just so you know, we are streaming live on Crowdcast, the channel. You can just click the link, come to the show, and ask James questions after the show. Also, when you click the link, you will be notified of upcoming episodes with real leaders, social entrepreneurs, and the crazy people who are so crazy that they think they can change the world. We have a home for them here at the Real Leaders Podcast, and if you want to learn more from them, you click that button. Next thing, folks, uh, leave us a review. Let us know what you think about the show. When people come to the channel, uh, help us help them understand what they can expect and what you like about the show. Um, and lastly, folks, at the end of the show and throughout the entire show, you can ask James questions. All you got to do is go to the bottom right. There's a little chat box down there. Just type in your questions and I'll ask James them after the show. With that being said, folks, let's get going here in five, four, three, two, and one. And welcome, everyone, to this episode of the Real Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Edwards. Joining us today is the CEO of Client Earth, Mr. James Thornton. James, thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Of course, of course. Well, James, you're here and you're coming from the, the UK and you're the CEO of Client Earth. So Client Earth, does that mean you represent the planet? Well, so I am a lawyer and uh, I'm an environmental lawyer. And the idea in calling it Client Earth was, was very much the idea that uh, myself and the lawyers who work with me would work on behalf of the planet and everybody who lives on it. So you, everyone who's listening, uh, you're all our clients. So everyone who's living on the planet. And um, what uh, what that means is that we're uh, set up as a charity uh, and the earth being the client doesn't come into the room. Uh, so we have to look at the science to understand uh, uh, what the earth is saying. So we always start with the science. But the idea, and we can go into more of that if you like, but the idea very much is to give representation to natural systems, uh, to people. So we try and stop air pollution, stop people from uh, being exposed to toxic substances. Uh, we try and reduce or stop uh, climate change, keep fish in the sea, you know, everything to keep a, a healthy planet and people. So James, how did you get into uh, environmental law? What drew you to, uh, uh, or at least a, did you have a calling to protect the planet? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, as a young person, I was uh, very, very, very much in, in love with all living things. You know, I, as a kid, I crawled around and looked at bugs, and then I was a little older and started watching birds and, you know, all of that. And um, I think an awful lot of kids do. And I think it's a really natural thing for people to love nature. I mean, everyone loves taking a walk uh, in, the, uh, in, in nature. And I had a particularly strong uh, calling for it, really. And I thought uh, for a long time I was going to become a biologist. And then uh, at university, really, I, I realized that um, already at that point in the 1970s, there were a lot of environmental problems showing up. Uh, and Earth Day had happened you know, and uh, a dawning consciousness uh, was coming that, gee, uh, the world is in trouble if we don't change the way we run business, the way we do transportation, the way we do agriculture and all of that. And I, I thought, well, I, I want to I want to do that. I want to join. And at that point, there was very little law to save the planet. So I went when I went to law school, I went to NYU uh, in, the, in the US, uh, in New York. And um, there was no environmental law course even when I went to law school. So uh, it was very much at the beginning of the field that I, that I got into this and helped develop the field. So I worked in New York, worked in California, uh, where I think you are today. Uh, and I set up an office in Los Angeles. Um, to take care of uh, the uh, the planet there, the climate there, the local um, environmental issues coming on in California. And it was after I moved to Europe uh, that I set up uh, Client Earth, because this idea of lawyers trying to save the planet and people's health uh, is was very much an American idea. I mean, it grew up in the 70s in the US. And when I came to the EU, when I came to Europe, I found that the 
although the environmentalists were quite sophisticated in using various techniques like lobbying and policy development, uh, there were no lawyers involved to speak of and no group of lawyers. So um, the, uh, the tremendous power that using law gives you just wasn't being used by the environmental movement. And uh, it became, talking about entrepreneurship, uh, a great opportunity. So I saw that there was a completely open field uh, and brought this American intellectual DNA into the culture of Europe where it's thrived, it's grown. And it's 13 years old now, Client Earth. And we have, as of yesterday, it was 215 employees, 110 lawyers, lawyers on staff, full-time staff from 26 different countries. Uh, and then offices in London, Brussels, Berlin, Warsaw, Beijing, very important one in Beijing, uh, and uh, soon in, uh, in the United States as well. It's fascinating. You know, it's interesting, though, be, that you have lawyers all across the world because this is an interconnected problem. Mm. How does a lawyer uh, make laws that uh, impact the entire world, I guess? Well, it's it's country by country, place by place, bit by bit. Uh, but but some of them are enormously impactful, uh, uh, like, for example, in uh, the environmental laws, as much law in Europe is made in Brussels. So uh, Brussels is like the Washington DC of Europe in, in, in many ways. And uh, if you want to have an impact on how an environmental law gets written uh, for all of the European countries, you go to Brussels uh, and participate in that uh, quite complicated process. So um, in over the last many years now, uh, our, our teams have written uh, key passages of, uh, of European environmental laws. So writing laws is one part of it. Um, and then, uh, Enforcing laws is, is another part. We're using laws to stop what you might think of as, uh, you know, unsocial behavior. So um, in terms of climate change, um, the I talked about uh, needing to learn what the earth needs by talking to scientists. When I set this thing up in London, uh, well, that was about 14 years ago, I talked to the scientists. They said, uh, number one public enemy when it comes to climate change is burning coal to generate electricity. Coal-fired power stations, public enemy number one. See if you can stop any new ones from being put up in Europe. At that time, I had two people or three people with me. And I said, sure, we can stop any new coal-fired power stations from being built in Europe. But uh, all these years later, indeed, we have. Uh, there haven't been any new ones uh, built in Europe. We've stopped in Poland alone, 30 of them. Uh, and you use different techniques. So there are various kinds of actions you can bring, uh, often the the whole idea uh, of building it is not well uh, doesn't take uh, into account the environmental regulations so you can say in a lawsuit you haven't taken account of the environmental regulations but uh ones i uh, really like are cases that we brought recently very innovative so um the, the great news for the world is that uh the energy that's cheapest to build right now is renewable energy and not fossil fuel energy. Uh, that's why we have a hope and a very good hope of saving civilization. So uh, the Polish government uh, owned a company and wanted to build one more big coal-fired power station. We knew that we could show economically that it was a bad idea, just because it is. Um, and uh, so what we did, and no one's ever done this before, we bought shares in the company. We didn't bring an environmental case. We Thank brought you. a cor corporate law case pure corporate law case. And we said, you, well, we sued the officers and directors personally. And we said, you are violating your duty to us as shareholders by making this terrible investment in coal. You should be making a better investment in renewable energy. And the amazing thing is, uh, Poland, quite conservative country, but uh, the judge gave us the victory. And the punchline is that the next morning, the stock price went up almost 4%. So the market was on our side. And that's a, an illustration of how you can use it all very creatively uh, to try and achieve a good environmental objective. Let's stay on coal for a second. Like, what is the argument, I guess, what would be the opposing argument against you? Coal isn't bad for the environment. There really isn't any. Um, the uh, I, I know various people like uh, the guy who's uh, currently, unfortunately, in the White House, thinks that uh, coal might be a good idea. Um, there, um, There's really no excuse for using coal anymore because it is by far the most carbon intensive way to produce energy 
and causes massive air pollution. There's a lot of inertia in the system. So there are people who are still uh, uh, employed in mining coal and in running coal plants. And what needs to happen is that there needs to be a transition away from it in which those people are given good jobs and uh, training into other careers. They'll have much longer life if they're not mining coal. Uh, it's one of the worst jobs you can have. Running coal plants, not so great either. So there's really no excuse to run them anymore. Um, and uh, the opportunity to build clean energy is enormous. Uh, but one really interesting thing, to get off coal for a second and just go out staying with fossil fuels, Exxon Mobil was one of the uh, most valuable companies on the uh, uh, on the stock exchange for a very, very long time. I read last month that uh, there's a renewable energy company in Florida, which now has an assessed value higher than Exxon. It really gives you a sense of where the market is going and where companies need to go. Interesting. Now, is there a difference between, because I just want to stay on coal really quick. Is okay. there a difference between uh, coal mining in the United States versus coal mining in China and India? Well, um, there's more of it mined uh, at, at the moment uh, in those countries, I think, uh, because uh, they're still quite heavily dependent on coal. Um, but it's it's pretty similar. A lot of it's mined in uh, Australia as well. Uh, it's devastating to the environment to mine it. It's devastating to the health of the of the people who do the mining, and then it's devastating to burn it. Um, now in, in China, there are still about a thousand, something like a thousand coal plants, um, and they're uh, still building some. Although the great news is that the the president of China just announced a couple of weeks ago that the country is going to go carbon neutral before 2060. Um, and Japan announced uh, two weeks ago that they're going carbon neutral by 2050, South Korea by 2050. These are all countries that are burning coal. Um, and banks in Australia, Australia is one of the big coal mining countries, have just announced, uh, the three or four of the biggest banks, uh, that they're not going to loan any money anymore to either mining uh, coal or running or building coal-fired power stations. So the, the economy is moving quickly. The ship is turning. Interesting. I, I love hearing those things. The thing that I'm like skeptical of is, will this actually work? Will this actually happen? What are your thoughts on like the Paris Accord? It was signed in 2016. Uh, 178 countries signed it to commit to keep being uh, the global temperature under two degrees Celsius. Some say it should have been 1.5 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. um, in the year of 2017, there was a report that came out by Nature Magazine. It was like, none of these countries have stuck to what they said they were going to do. Uh, so when you hear things like that from China, from India, from especially, you know, China is building four coal plants like every month. Like what goes through your mind and legally, what are some of the things that you think, you know, actually uh, propel or prevent uh, countries from destroying the earth? Well, so uh, now on China, the um, uh, we actually work very closely uh, in China uh, with the Chinese government. I was invited to go and help the Supreme Court of China oh, wow. write a law to allow citizens to sue polluting companies, including those owned by the government. That's amazing news in the West because you only hear all kinds of bad stories, which I understand. Uh, but uh, but they, they did that. They wrote that law in 2014 already. Uh, and then the prosecutors came to us uh, and asked us uh, to train them, the federal prosecutors in China, uh, how to uh, sue the Chinese government, because this law I helped uh, allowed the prosecutors to sue government departments on behalf of the people. Um, so remarkable changes going on in China. Uh, and they're very eager to take care of the environment uh, for for, you might say, uh, self-interested reasons, which is a very good reason to do it. Because they're saying, oh, the air is so polluted, the water is so polluted, the soil is so polluted, um, this is gonna destroy the economy, people are very unhappy, we need to take care of this. That's enlightened self-interest, if you like, which is a good motivator. So they really get that, and they really get it on climate change too. And, um, you know, they, uh, my experience uh, uh, of them, and that of, you know, the world in general, is that they tend to under-promise and overperform, so that when they say they're going to be carbon neutral by 2060, it's likely they'll be carbon neutral before then. And they've released uh, studies showing how they intend to get there, how they intend to stop building coal, and 
how they intend to start turning off the existing coal plants. They build annually uh, more renewable energy than the rest of the world put together. So do I think they're going to do it? Well, I actually do, um, because they, they get that it's a very positive thing to do. And they, they want to be there for a long time with a healthy population. They have one thing they have is a very long term view. They've been there for 2,500 years. So uh, if the West is going to uh, stay uh, competitive, we need to be thinking the same way. James, you mentioned you've uh, had some a lot of con conversations with many scientists. Yeah. What have been some of those conversations that have stuck out to you to say this is such a severe problem? And how has that influenced your legal uh, drafts, I guess? Sure. Well, um, you know, gee, there, there are a lot of them. Um, let me just try and pick one. Um, well, here's one. I was talking to a physicist who knows a lot about the Antarctic, you know, uh, and, uh, and he was saying, you know, the, uh, when I talk to other scientists um, in private, uh, things actually sound worse than they do in public. And this is something that most people don't know. The public doesn't know this. So he said, you know, the, uh, and I know it's true. He, he said, you know, scientists are actually amazingly conservative uh, about what they say in public. You know, they, uh, they have rigorous standards of proof and they, and science is a very tough game. And scientists are always trying to prove the other one is wrong, uh, which is good because it means they get the right answer. But it also means they, they don't go out on a limb. So when they say something, it tends to be conservative. So he said, you, you know, it's actually worse uh, in terms of how quickly things are moving with climate change than, than scientists generally say in public. And he said, imagine this, you know, there's this huge ice sheet uh, in uh, West Antarctica. Um, and, you know, if it were to uh, get dumped on the ocean, uh, ocean level rises a couple of meters, New York and L.A., Venice and lots of other cities are in trouble. And he said, but, uh, you know, it's not just abstract. Uh, he said the, uh, the thing about it is that it's shaped like a, a bowl, the bedrock there. It's a deep bowl. Uh, and this huge amount of ice is sitting in this bowl. The bowl is actually under sea level. Uh, and there's just now a lip of ice preventing seawater from coming in and filling the bowl. And then you get all of the ice essentially in the ocean so sea level goes up and that's closer to happening than um than we think so when i heard that i said got got to go so uh and what the project that came out of that was um i'm i'm working with our whole team uh to come up uh, with uh, a way of working with hundreds of citizen groups throughout asia uh, and governments in asia to move asia off coal so there are something like 450 coal-fired power stations that are currently planned to be built. And the idea will be to change energy markets uh, and to uh, move markets in the direction of renewable energy, and then to begin shutting down the existing coal plants as we're doing so successfully in, in Europe. So there you get a, a good example of scientists saying something quite dramatic. And then I'm thinking, okay, what can I do to prevent that? How do I slow that down? And then you look around and you say, well, there are all of these coal-fired power stations <clears throat> we need in, in Asia. 80% of it is in Asia of the burning of coal uh, in coal-fired power stations, you know, for energy. So you say, well, that needs to shift. That needs to move into clean energy. And then the world has a chance to get, as you were saying, uh, to the Paris Agreement goals. It's, it's really interesting to me. And I just find that so fascinating. First off, kudos to you all for really putting in the work and doing those things that are so necessary in this day and age. Um, now, renewable energy, uh, we've had a lot of uh, uh, solar uh, CEOs on the show, mm -hmm. uh, very promising technology, mm -hmm. it's very efficient, it's cost where everyone thinks it's really hard to install. It's not really the case. It, it is a scalable technology. Now, mm -hmm. I also saw the other day that the uh, the use of energy and the so the use of coal energy is going down in the United States. Yep. We're talking about uh, the use of natural gas is up. What are you? What are your thoughts on natural gas? Obviously, this comes from fossil fuels. It's burnt. It's it's stored. Uh, is natural gas uh, a solution uh, that that we can um, use to transition away from, let's say, oil and coal? Well, um, to a degree, but it's uh, it's very it would be very easy for civilization to get hooked on natural gas because there's a lot of it around, um, and 
you know, per unit of electricity that you generate, it produces less climate change than coal does. So per unit of electricity, it's better. But if you switch the whole economy over to uh, burning natural gas, uh, you're still going to get a very, very dangerous climate change. You know, you won't be able to meet the Paris Agreement targets. So um, the uh, gas industry is is very much saying um, dump coal, dump oil, and uh, and use only gas. But it's uh, it would be a dangerous thing to get hooked to. So uh, what you need to do is to move from the worst ones that we're on now, coal and uh, oil, straight to straight to clean. Uh, and that more and more becomes possible. I mean, uh, that t even 10 years ago didn't look like a realistic option, but but it really does now. Uh, I think I read it was like 80, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, James, 80 or 85% of the energy here in the United States is powered by oil and gas right now. How do you see like this transition going? Do you completely eliminate oil? How do you see us easing off something that we've been so dependent on mm -hmm. for decades yeah well i mean you it, you don't do it overnight obviously um and uh there uh it's it's used in in different ways in in different uh, uh parts of society so um you know the, one of the main uses of oil in the u.s is uh, is for vehicles so you know cars run on uh gas uh, and uh, um it's also used to generate electricity and and for other things um but if the the electricity part is is easy to pick up with renewables um and then uh, if you generate enough re uh, build enough renewables you begin to generate uh enough electricity to move the vehicle fleet to uh, an electric vehicle fleet so um first you need to build lots of renewables and have the cheap electricity available and then you'd be able to run cars on electricity um and ultimately on hydrogen as well if you have enough uh, electricity in the system, um, then uh, when the price comes down further, which it's doing quickly, you can generate cheap um, uh, hydrogen from water and electricity, uh, as much hydrogen as you want. And then you can use hydrogen to run cars as well. And hydrogen, uh, if you generate it with green electricity, is a really, really green fuel and produces zero emissions. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Andrew, I heard about uh, electricity coming from uh, hydrogen, and I'd like to go into that a little bit more. I, I, you know, I think it's a collective effort uh, that's going to take some time. It's like right now, if you really want to have an impact, you know, if you buy a Tesla, you have to have solar panels because if you plug your car in, most likely that energy is coming from coal-powered uh, sources or oil-powered sources. Uh, sources. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it really needs to be a collective effort that I think a lot of people are missing in that in that sense. Now, explain to us about uh, maybe free markets. How are free markets and, and capitalism and, and innovation driving these changes? What are you seeing? Uh, and, and from a lawyer's perspective, how can you help? Yes, well, I mean, what I see is an awful lot of very smart entrepreneurs and investors uh, moving away from fossil fuel towards renewable energy. Um, I mentioned earlier the example of, uh, I was just reading in the Financial Times today, uh, the big banks in, um, in Australia have traditionally invested in coal uh, and in uh, coal generation. Uh, they're just stopping that. Um, we were involved in Japan recently um, in a shareholders resolution to get one of the largest uh, Japanese banks to stop investing in new coal. Uh, and, and it did. Um, so you see that when, when you go up the chain uh, of investors and you get big banks saying we will no longer invest in, in coal, uh, the next step will be no longer invest in fossil fuels at all, but instead in re renewable energy, that begins to drive the market uh, quite nicely. Um, and, uh, you know, I mentioned that we had brought the case, uh, a successful corporate law case against a com an energy company that wanted to build a coal-fired power station. You know, uh, pretty soon, as the economics get better and better for renewables and worse and worse for fossil fuels, um, investors will start to say to banks, um, you know, unless you get out of investing in fossil fuels and into renewables in a major way, just take the fossil fuels out of your portfolio or we will sue you because as shareholders, you're not working for us. You know, you're uh, you're making a stupid investment. So you're going to see that transition pretty fast. And um, the uh, um, 
one of the things you want to do if you're running any sort of company at all um, is to say, how do I become carbon neutral myself? You know, the um, uh, uh, Paris Agreement it, it targets, uh, if we're going to get there, require the world to become uh, carbon neutral by 2050. But companies are going to get uh, more and more and more pressure from investors uh, to go carbon neutral much quicker uh, than that. And those that do uh, will be very successful, and those that don't will simply go bankrupt. I mean, I think it's it's really as simple as that. James, you mentioned uh, self interest. Uh, I think a lot of like in China, you know, it's the air so the, the air quality is so poor there. Mm -hmm. uh, lawyers are stepping up; they're coming to you to ask for advice. How do hey? How do we sue these corporations? What's the procedure for this? What are the protocols? I think self interest is one of the scariest things for me for climate change, because people don't notice it. Right. Unless unless you're in a fire. I mean, here in California, unless you're in a fire, you're in a coastal area. It's it's not something that you can see. It's almost like COVID in that sense. Like how does self-interest like what do you mean by that in terms of self-interest when you say climate change? What are some factors that stick out to you? Well, so um, it is uh, it's self-interest of every individual. But you're right. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, understanding to to see it there unless you see the fires. But uh, uh, what I hear uh, from friends in Oregon, for example, is that there were a bunch of people who were in fires in Oregon and didn't connect it uh, still. So um, a lot of people do, a lot of people are waking up, but more people need to wake up to the reality of it. What I had in mind was really, the uh, I was talking about the more the, the self-interest of the society. So um, as you mentioned, 173, it's actually more than that, I think 180 something countries signed the Paris Agreement. Um, and that was those governments saying, uh, we have an interest in protecting our, our citizens. We have a self-interest, you know, in uh, the future. And that interest requires us to deal with climate change. If our citizens are going to have a good future, we need to deal with climate change. And certainly the Chinese see it that way. You know, they're, they're saying if, we, if we're going to have a, a healthy um, a country, a, a good economy and healthy citizens, we need to deal with pollution and, and climate change. You asked, how do you do it? Well, there are a lot of ways you do it. Um, you know, stopping coal by using legal means is, is one thing. Um, another uh, group of things, you mentioned air pollution. Another group of suits we did in the uh, in throughout Europe, and we're still working on, are air pollution cases. Because uh, coal causes very bad air pollution, uh, and uh, diesel vehicles cause very bad air pollution. Diesel vehicles, not so important in the United States, but a big deal in the rest of the world. Um, and... Uh, we brought a series of air pollution cases uh, through most European countries, 20 European countries now, about 80 cases. And we've been winning all of all of those cases. And we've been, uh, uh, we started in the UK because uh, that's where I happened to have started client earth. But now we're in Germany. So as soon as we won in the UK, we went to Germany because the diesel vehicles, which are the, the worst form of transport engines, um, uh, really their heartland and homeland is Germany. You have Volkswagen, Mercedes, BMW, Porsche, all really wanting to continue with uh, diesel engines. So we went to Düsseldorf, Stuttgart, Munich, the home of the German motor industry, and we brought air pollution cases and we won them uh, because the air was far more polluted than the law allows. People die early uh, of this kind of stuff this schmutz in the air, and the judges banned diesel vehicles from coming into the center of these cities, which meant we saw the market, to get back to the market, the market changed quickly. And uh, almost overnight, of the uh, take up, the purchase of diesel vehicles went down by like 20%. Um, and the, um, uh, the industry periodicals attributed that to these lawsuits. And that's one of the reasons that then the German car companies started moving much more quickly to electric. Uh, and the way I see those cases is not only were we trying to clean up the air to protect people's health, not only were we trying to do something for climate, but we're actually trying to benefit the German motor industry because the Chinese motor industry was way ahead of the Europeans uh, in terms of electric vehicles. Uh, and if they were going to stick with their diesel engines, they were going to be outcompeted you know, uh, in time. So now they have a chance to, uh, to compete on a uh, level playing field, but it was because citizens like us uh, and all the groups we work with uh, in Germany, in Milan, we worked with the mothers of Milan who are out to reduce air pollution to keep their kids healthy. Uh, that pushed the market 
towards clean vehicles. Tremendous. I mean, a, a local impact there in Germany that impacts the entire world hmm. uh, where consumers are, are now saying, hey, I'm going to buy this hybrid vehicle uh, at this at a you know the same or even a better price than a, a gas powered mm -hmm. one. Uh, it's funny you, you brought up Oregon. That's actually where I grew up. And I was mm -hmm. actually in those fires uh, when okay. they were happening. My flight got delayed for four days uh, to, to get back here to California. It was a crazy experience. Uh, wearing an N95 mask outside just to block mm. out the, the the smoke, it was it was scary. It was a weird mm. time, um, and in, in, in a state that has so many evergreen trees um, and, and just beauty in nature. I mean, a lot of it's gone now. Uh, a lot of the, the lakes we used to go to as kids uh, completely er erased because of the fires. It's mm. it's, a, it's crazy times. Um, and, and that I, I want to stay on that point of self-interest, personal self-interest. Mm. I think kind of the, the sleeper in all of this is water, access to water, clean drinking water and how it's being used, uh, how scarce it is in, in some places. Mm -hmm. Drink the tap water in Oregon. Tastes great. Drink the tap water down here in San Diego. Doesn't taste good. Uh, what are your what's your work with water? Uh, clean water here in the United States and, and around the globe? Well, water is an enormously important issue. You're, you're right to look at it. And it is a sleeper. Most people aren't focused on it because uh, certainly in the U.S., you just take it for granted. Or in developed countries, you can still take it for granted. In much of the world, already, you can't take it for granted. Um, and uh, the Pentagon, quite correctly, sees the reduction in availability of clean water uh, around the world as one of the what they call a threat multiplier. So uh, it will cause uh, conflict uh, that the United States might wind up involved in. Uh, and one way to reduce that is again, to reduce climate change. You know, if you want to reduce these threat multipliers, uh, self-interest of the United States and every other country is to help stop climate change um, so that you don't wind up having these uh, regional conflicts that uh, you might get drawn into. But uh, stopping climate change is one thing. Um, the, uh, the other is that, um, you know, uh, if you produce really cheap renewable energy um, in large quantities, uh, then no matter where you are in the world, uh, you'll be able to uh, produce clean water from seawater. Uh, more and more people are going to have to do that, you know, and it's very expensive to do it if you're doing it and with traditional fossil fuels uh, and uh, if you produce um, lots of renewable energy where the price comes down to to the point where it's essentially free, which it does at a certain point, um, then you've got uh, the ability to generate drinking water from you know, perfectly clean drinking water from uh, from seawater, which is going to be it's already important in some places. It's going to be important and certainly in California um, in, in coming years. And that's the way to get there. It's, it is scary. And that's an interesting fact to what you brought out about the UN report. I think it was like one, I had a guest on the show. She's like one in three people have access to clean drinking water. She went on uh, advocacy. I know you're, you're a big proponent of advocacy. How do we raise awareness about these yeah. topics? She went on a run uh, or she did, uh, went on a run. She did seven marathons in seven oh. weeks in seven different countries to raise awareness about it. Uh, the CEO of Thirst. And uh, she said on those runs, she came across villages where a water truck would come in, give out the water, and the kids and the, and the mothers and the fathers, they'd fight over the waters. Mm. What does that look like, like on a macro scale when people are actually mm. you know, dying of thirst and they need that? It's, it's an interesting thought to think about. Now, the Paris Accord, uh, we expect the developed countries to uh, basically be the, the role models, the leaders in this. I asked a, an environmental lawyer in preparation for this interview about this. One of my friends, he's studying to be one. He was really interested in the North-South divide. And I don't mm -hmm. know if that's a term that, okay, so it is a term that you're aware of. Uh, merging countries and their impact on developing uh, nations. W how do you see, uh, I guess, the the difference, the comparison between a, a, a country in the North that is a, a developed country versus a, a developing nation? Mm -hmm. Well, there uh, there is a whole range of differences, of course. Uh, one one important one is the the, the ability of the, the country to find the financing to do some of the things you need to do. Um, so the way the Paris Agreement works is that it um, uh, allows every country 
to come up with its own plan for how to reduce carbon emissions, which was a very good idea because, you know, Panama and Nigeria are quite different from the United States. They have different issues, different problems. Um, but the United States, uh, which I hope stays in the Paris Agreement, um, has uh, the, the capacity to invest in uh, any technology of any type and to reduce its emissions if it chooses to do so. Much harder in Nigeria, you know, or or, or in Egypt, you know. Uh, and so what's the, simply because of the, the lack of capital uh, and the, the, the lack of technical expertise in some countries. So the um, it's very important then, and one of the things that's always discussed, and it's uh, it's a hard thing to work out, is how the developed countries can transfer technology and support the um, the adoption of the technology in developing countries. Um, it's one of the things that uh, should get more attention than it does, uh, and it's one of the things that uh, the developed countries should be uh, more generous about than they are. There are often big promises, uh, and indeed there are with the Paris Agreement, big promises that aren't quite delivered on. You know, so uh, I, you're not going to be able to see the countries do what they need to do unless there is support from the, um, the developed world. And uh, the two points you made earlier of everything being interconnected and then of enlightened self-interest. Um, if the developed countries are smart, um, it's in their self-interest to help the developing countries uh, get um, good, clean technology in place uh, so that they don't, for example, go through a fossil fuel stage, but go right to uh, to clean energy, if you want to keep the whole world cool. I, I think the example, just to give our audience, was he showed me a oil spill in Japan that mm -hmm. impacted Mauritius, or an, a, a Japanese carrier that impacted Mauritius, whether it's the oil spill in the Gulf. Uh, my question was this, is like, how do you put a price on that damage? And what is the role of the legal department to come in and measure this damage to say, hey, BP, you just destroyed you know, decades of coral that's going to impact the, the marine fish that live there. They're going to impact the sharks and impact everyone else in the ocean and you know, the 1% of the population in the world that you know, lives in the coast. Like, How do you put a price on something like that and hold these big corporations accountable? Mm. Good question. And it's not easy to do. I mean, so uh, BP wound up spending uh, billions, I forget how many billions for the uh, for this bill in the, in the Gulf. Uh, so there was some compensation for the fishermen, and for the for the states to mop up the, the spill and all that. Um, but uh, and, and that's hard to do. I mean, you get basically what you do is the court brings in a lot of scientific evidence uh, and uh, a lot of economic evidence to try and come up with uh, with a number. Um, that compensates people, um, but you know it's uh, it's very much the second best um, because that money doesn't really compensate well for damage like that, uh, which can be permanent um, and certainly is very very long term. And what you want to do instead of having money damages uh, for disasters like that that happen is prevent them from happening in the first place. So if you weren't relying on oil, um, you wouldn't have oil spills. You know, if you were, uh, and Texas is a wonderful example. I mean, Texas is one of the top places in the world for renewable energy, and most people don't know that. Uh, but lots of sun, lots of wind, and uh, smart people there have been investing in renewable energy. Um, so uh, Texas is a place where you can begin to see the shift from digging for oil to generating renewable energy. And if you base the economy on renewable energy, then there are no more oil spills. You know, you re reduce a lot of these problems by by moving to what's clean. So, James, uh, you mentioned, I hope the United States stays in the Paris Accord. A yep. lot of people don't know this. We're still in. You can't withdraw until I think it's two days in November 2020. What, why do you say, why do you want the United States to stay in this Paris Accord if all emerging countries have not followed up to what they said they were going to do in 2016? Yes, well, uh, so far, no, no country has uh, fully uh, performed, but lots of countries are trying. Uh, and uh, in, there's a global meeting next year. It was supposed to happen this year, but the COVID business uh, right, that whole move to next year. Yeah. So next year, we'll see countries ratcheting up uh, their, uh, their performance. Um, so, I, uh, and so you have all of Europe 
uh, saying that it will be carbon neutral by 2050. You see the UK, which just left the European Union, saying the same thing. Uh, I mentioned earlier Japan, South Korea are saying the same thing. Uh, China is saying before 2060. So you have, um, uh, when you have Europe and uh, China uh, and Japan, uh, you have um, the, some of the world's biggest economies saying we will be carbon neutral by 2050. So we will be able to meet the Paris uh, uh, Agreement. Uh, and then the, the big one missing from that from that game, of course, is is the United States, which is in a very good position to do it because uh, of it being such a high technology country. And and you're right. Um, the uh, uh, the current administration uh, uh, said that it would take the United States out of the Paris Agreement, but uh, the uh, the way the the agreement it works it takes quite a while to come out so it's november 4th uh, which would be the official withdrawal date uh, and depending on what happens on november 3rd uh, you know we uh, we may see the united states staying in why does the united states have to stay in well as i said these other big economies are moving to meet what they said they would do and what they need to do in order to meet the paris agreement targets the world will be able to do it um, if the United States joins in. Um, if you have the biggest economies in the world doing it, uh, you have uh, a beautiful chance to, to hit the targets right. And they will also be generating all of the subsidiary technologies that then can be shared with all of the other countries. I had a really interesting thought leader come on the show the other day, and I think you'll like this. He was talking about ESG. We've been talking a lot about investment, the roles in that, how do you measure your impact that's been a very interesting discussion. Hmm. One, he said at one point he was at a conference and someone said, you know what? I think the environment should fall on the legal side. And I also had someone yesterday that said, you know, a lot of businesses are saying we should be a force for good. Do good. Do good. Or is the question, do no harm? Mm -hmm. James, to you, where do you, like, should businesses be trying to do good or do no harm? Well, if you do no harm, you do good. So, uh, you know, and um, what you want is, so this concept that we've been talking about of carbon neutrality, for example, um, if you get your economy to be uh, carbon neutral, um, then you're creating, that's really, you're really doing good. You're creating an opportunity for a civilization to be here for a very long time. I often see our work as um, trying to help <clears throat> create um, a safe space for all of the new technologies and trying to move the old technologies off the road so that the uh, new companies, clean technologies, can move down the capitalist road, you know, and deliver what needs needs to happen. But if you get to a carbon neutral economy, uh, you've achieved um, the greatest thing really that anyone could possibly imagine these days, which is um, the beginnings of what I call an ecological civilization. So for me, that's the big idea. That's the big goal. Uh, and environmentalists like me have often um, been very negative in the stories we tell. It's like, this is happening, that's happening, you know, be angry, be uh, be ashamed and all of that. I think what we need to do is instead to have a very positive vision. Uh, it's a positive vision that motivates people. You know, it's only a positive idea that pulls you along and you say, oh, great, I can join in on that. And for me, uh, this concept of an ecological civilization, uh, one in which uh, industry uh, does no harm, one in which transport does no harm, one in which energy systems do no harm, one in which agriculture does no harm. Agriculture does good by feeding people, but is the main reason globally for biodiversity, for nature going down, 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 down. You know, while climate change is going up, uh, nature is going down, and the main reason is agriculture. So uh, again, uh, it can be done uh, in, uh, in a very good and sustainable way, uh, just like energy can be generated in a clean and sustainable way. And when you put these things together, you begin to get a, this vision of an ecological civilization in which everything that we do to support ourselves actually is harmless, does no harm. Uh, and then uh, what a positive world you've created for you know, our future generations. It's a, it's a beautiful idea. And it's one that is now one that if we all contribute to can be realized. We can, we can get there. James, that's a beautiful advice from many years of experience. Now, for lawyers listening to this, uh, you've had so many cases that have uh, had a positive impact on this society, on air pollution, on reforestation, uh, on keeping the water clean, 
uh, on ocean cleanup, the list goes on and on. What is your advice to young lawyers listening to this that want to have a similar impact? Well, um, the uh, I would say the uh, uh, law is the, the most powerful uh, armor and weapon. So, uh, you know, if you find yourself in love with the world, in love with nature, in love with people, you know, and you love life, um, your heart is very open, right? So, um, so how do you take that and then turn it into tough activity? Well, the law is a perfect armor. Um, you know, you learn the law and you can keep your heart open while learning about the law and learning what you can do. And then it's a perfect weapon. So shield and sword. Um, you can then figure out what you want to do. For example, stop air pollution or save fish or stop climate change. Um, and then learn law and learn to use it creatively. Uh, and American lawyers are the ones who are really creative, you know, um, and use law in this, uh, in this very positive way. It's, um, it's a tradition starting with the civil rights movement. Uh, lawyers were very creative in, in using law. And then it went over into the environmental movement. And you can use, as a lawyer, all of your creative skills and keep your heart open. Uh, so with that armor and with that weapon, there's a tremendous amount that you can do. And there's an infinite number of things that need to be done. So Klein Earth, I mean, I mentioned we have about 110 lawyers. That's pretty good having started as a charity now 13 years ago. But uh, there should be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of such groups, thousands of such groups all over the world, because every country, every community needs people who can understand how the regulatory system works, how the legal system works. And often what we do is we find ourselves helping governments that may have the right idea uh, and the right attitude, but don't know how to get there. Sure. So even governments need this help. So you need to fight things and keep bad things from happening, but you need also to empower good things uh, by good people. Uh, because you have the skills to do it. I love that. Now, James, we started this interview saying you're the CEO of Client Earth. So that means you represent the planet. So let's say you're about to go to trial and you take the planet into a room. What's the one piece of advice you give it? Uh, I never give it advice. I always ask it for advice. Uh, it goes the other way around. Uh, I don't. I don't advise. I, I don't advise the Earth. I always ask the Earth what it needs. I love that. James spoke a really last question for you. Let's bring this home. What is your definition of a real leader? Well, for me, uh, a leader is uh, someone who has a vision, you know, and an intention to take that vision forward. You clarify your vision, uh, and you clarify your intention. That's really the first thing. Uh, and then second, you listen very deeply to as many people as you can um, for information uh, and for their points of view. You listen and listen and listen with a very open mind. Uh, and then what you find is that the ideas that you need crystallize. Then uh, you tell stories. You need to take time to understand how to take the wisdom you've captured from all these many people relating to your vision and turn it into a story uh, that you can communicate and a, a, a simple uh, story. I mean, Client Earth was born out of my telling stories. You know, the, all of this work uh, is about storytelling. When you win in court, it's because you took really complicated stuff and made a simple story. I've stood up many times in the courtroom and said, Your Honor, this is a simple case. Um, and uh, by the time I got there, I'd made it a simple case. So the vision, you know, the listening, um, and then telling the right story. I love that, uh, James. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. I've learned so much. Uh, I loved having you on the show. You might be the only lawyer I like here. Uh, <laughs> it's in the, um, you know, for everyone listening out there, I appreciate you hanging on. We're going to have James stick on for a, a few more questions after the show, but for the CEO of Planet Earth, James Thornton. I'm Kevin Edwards asking you to go out there, articulate a simple vision, folks, and always keep it real. Thanks, James. Thank you. All right, good people. Thanks for hanging on. How about that? Let's give a round of applause for James here. 
learned a lot today. I uh, was very interested about uh, how environmental law impacted uh, the earth and, and the corporations and, and really just everyone in between. Uh, so really, really an interesting discussion today. I think a lot of you uh, hung on. We had a lot of people come on, 20 guests here on the show today. Now, we have a few questions flying in. This one came in from Richard throughout the show. Uh, and I'm just going to read this right off the bat. Um, James, this is for you. It says a question. James, in some of the countries you work, there can be significant political pressure put on courts and lawyers, particularly when challenging legacy interests. Have members of your team had political or similar pressures put on them when representing client Earth? How do you address and deal with those issues? Many thanks, Richard. Mm. It's a great question. And um, I mean, as we go into uh, to uh, Asia, this will become um, more pressing uh, because there are a number of Asian countries in which it is very difficult to, to do this kind of work. And then we'll need to learn new skills, frankly, because as you take this work from country to country, your the basic concept is one that you need to take into a new culture and learn the way to do it. But, you know, I thought it was going to be um, uh, relatively easy in, in the EU. As, you, as an American, you think, oh, well, you know, very cultured place. And it is a very cultured place. But uh, we got to Poland. And um, I mean, it wasn't easy. We were, we were trying to uh, stop all these new coal-fired power stations, dozens of them, from being built. And the government at that point was really intent on building them. We've changed that dialogue. But um, but we were denounced by the Treasury Minister as uh, enemies of the state, uh, and the head of the office got death threats on the phone. Um, so uh, so we have encountered some of that. Um, actually, he's a very brave guy, and um, you know the, it included the sounds of AK forty sevens, you know, firing. Um, and um, this was on his very private phone. I didn't have that number. Only his wife and mother and brother had that number. So uh, it was very likely the security services, I, I guess. And I asked him, you know, if he was fr very frightened. And he said, um, somewhat frightened. He said, this is Poland. Uh, uh, if they wanted, if I was to be very frightened, I would have had my legs broken. So, um, so this work can be dangerous. I mean, uh, we're not working in some countries because there is no rule of law. I mean, we work in five African countries to protect forests right now, but um, we haven't gone into the democratic, so-called Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, because um, there are, uh, it's a very complicated kind of civil war situation, and you just couldn't guarantee the safety of people at all. Um, so it, the answer is country by country, it's, it's different, and you really need to learn and calibrate what you're doing. James, the second question comes from Ciara Shannon, and Ciara asks, the UK Climate Change Act is a great story. And with mm -hmm. it, the net zero target. But would you agree it has become snarled up in a system that doesn't yet acknowledge and value net zero? The fog of enactment prevails, which puts a lot of pressure on client Earth at all. How can there be more climate statutory legislation that must be adhered to, especially at the local level where important decisions such as West Cumbrium deep coal mine are decided? Mm -hmm. This is a very knowledgeable person. Thank you for your question. Um, so uh, one of the things, uh, so the uh, for those who aren't following uh, UK legislation as closely, um, the UK did uh, write quite a good uh, law uh, with the uh, Climate Change Act, um, which uh, has, it's a, it's a very nice system, uh, an expert group and very expert group of scientists, mostly scientists and some economists, uh, come up with um, a budget. The idea is to reduce the, the budget year by year um, so that the, the country produces less emissions year by year. The problem really is that uh, the the way the law was designed, the, the budget is advisory. You know, it's uh, it's not mandatory. So um, there's no way that client earth, I mean, we could bring a case and I'm sure someone will, um, but the law isn't nicely set up to enforce. It really isn't. Um, so what I'm thinking of doing, I mean, what I'm talking to people about now in the UK uh, is a new piece of legislation uh, in which would make it very clear that that carbon budget or greenhouse gas budget uh, was a budget that was as mandatory as the financial budget. So that if you were the prime minister and wanting to do something, 
um, like build a third runway at Heathrow, whatever it was, uh, a new coal mine, um, you could, you would have to justify it um, as against that carbon budget. Uh, and that would then be enforceable and mandatory. So citizens uh, would be able to hold the government to that budget. That's the really missing piece in the UK Climate Change Act, um, which has been copied by a number of other countries. Uh, so basic framework, very good. Uh, the enforceability is weak, and that's what needs to be improved. James, the third question comes from No. He just asks, if for people who aren't a lawyer, how can we get involved? Well, um, that's a good question. Uh, we're a charity. Go to our website. Support us. You know, uh, a dollar a month will help save the climate. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, what one way is, uh, uh, of course, is supporting any environmental group that you think is doing a good job. Uh, and that and that's important uh, to get informed. And then also vote. You know, um, it's very important if you care about the environment uh, in your local elections and your state elections and your national elections and whatever country you live in uh, to really focus on what is this person going to do to clean up the environment to be responsible about the climate um, if you want to have a good world for your kids. Uh, James, thanks for being on the show today. Last question, where can people learn more about Client Earth? Where should they go uh, and, and advice for them? Sure. Well, if you want to learn more about Client Earth and our work and the type of work we do and um, organizations that work with us um, because we work with many others, go to our website. So uh, easy to remember name, Client Earth, uh, and the website is www.clientearth.org. Um, and uh, tons of information on clientearth.org um, that I think you'll find interesting, which takes you now kind of globally into all of these issues. So clientearth.org. There's also a book that we wrote uh, called, guess what? Client Earth. Um, and it's, uh, it's quite a good book. And it's not just about our work. It's about how law gets used uh, in many places of the world to try and save the environment. And it's, it's kind of written like a thriller. It has that kind of John Grisham feel to it. So Client Earth, the book, if you're, uh, if you're stuck in, in, in a lockdown situation, uh, will, will make you feel very positive. That's Client Earth and clientearth.org. Uh, thank you everyone for listening to this episode of the Release Podcast with James Thornton. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. James, I had such a fun time getting to know you uh, and for people that want to listen to the edited up, we had a link flying earlier, subscribe to the real years podcast. This episode should be out in less than one week. You can go on there and be notified of its release and listen to more real leaders such as James and people who are trying to change the world. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, thanks for being a real leaders folks and always keep it real. Thanks James. Thank you, Kevin. Take care. See you. Thanks a lot.